Hi everyone and welcome to this fifth talk in the Tea Time with Trees webinar series of Season Watch. Season Watch is a citizen science project that runs across the country and anyone who is interested in uh, contributing scientific information on the flowering, fruiting and leafing of trees along with the seasons can participate uh, by registering with Season Watch. We are thrilled to have Vijay Dasmana here today to talk to us about an urban forest. Uh, Vijay Dasmana hails from the beautiful Gadwal region of Uttarakhand and he likes to call himself an ecological gardener who likes to uh, take up degraded landscapes for restoration work. He has been a part of several restoration projects in Delhi, NCR and Rajasthan because of this interest. He's an avid observer of plants and he has taught barefoot botanists at uh, WWF their botanizing skills. Uh, when he's not looking at plants directly, he's taking stunning pictures of them going about uh, their daily lives, making them look anything but mundane. So welcome Vijay and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Geeta. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. So uh, am I talking to everybody now? Yes, you are now addressing an audience of 189 people. Wow. <laughs> um, thank you for giving this opportunity to talk about uh, my 10 years of work with I am Gurgaon in creating this small place called City Forest of Gurgaon. And welcome everybody to this uh, talk. Uh, this is going to be about 14 minutes that I will talk and then 20 minutes for question and answer. I hope I can contain my slides into, into 40 minutes. It's more of a photo story than, than into an ecological journey. And uh, if you have questions, you can obviously type on the, on the chat side, yeah? So yeah, so thank you, Gita. Thank you, Season Watch, for giving this opportunity. Oops. Okay. So this is, uh, this is, uh, we are talking about a city forest in Gurgaon. Now, what is your idea of Gurgaon? Isn't this the idea of Gurgaon you have? It is a corporate hub, um, you know, lots of light, development, all young people working here. Uh, well, when I think of Gurgaon, or when I thought of Gurgaon, when I was not part of Gurgaon development work, this is what I thought of Gurgaon. But there is other side to Gurgaon. This is a March news article, which says the most polluted city in the world. This is a Greenpeace report, which talks about uh, polluted cities in the world. And Gurgaon was amongst the most polluted cities. In fact, the most polluted city. And we have here, sorry, we have here the list of polluted cities. And many of them are from India. Most of them are from India, two from Pakistan, one from, one from China. Not only polluted, our groundwater is also gone. So Gurgaon, uh, the water that you can get in Gurgaon is about, uh, the borewell we have at the park is about 300 feet yeah, deep. And uh, we are told that the water column disappearing per year is about three meters per year. So Gurgaon is facing acute shortage of drinking water because a lot of water is coming out from the ground and we are losing Arav leaves. And a lot is also coming from uh, rivers, but uh, a lot comes from the groundwater. So this is, this is the forest map of Haryana. And look at this um, on the, on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see um, forest land of Haryana. Uh, on the northern side, you can see a little bit of Shivalik forest. And on the southern side, and if you look at the slide on the right, where Gurgaon, Faridabad, Mewat region is there, that's where you have a little bit of forest. These are the Aravli forests, yeah, remnant Aravli forest. Mostly, mostly colonized by Prosopis juliflora, 
but there are some patches which are nice uh, which are beautiful such as mangalbani such as jhirka uh, um, these are really nice for us of course we have good diversity of uh, birds here we have damdama where you get lots of winter migrants you have uh, leopards you have uh, hyenas you have uh, jackals civets porcupines unfortunately the land uh, which is called true forest uh, in haryana is only is less than 1% so why i'm talking about haryana so much and all of this is because this has bearing with what i'm going to talk about later which is the city forest so we have less than 1% true forest in haryana which is really sad so if you do a google search and type forest in gurgaon this is what i got we did not find any result for forest in gurugram so we are showing you results for the forest around gurugram instead which is very sad another uh, reality unfortunate reality is what you see in the forest survey of india report haryana the green cover is has increased in haryana and uh, the green cover has increased because of these five species on uh, in rural areas and these five species in uh, other areas in urban areas so and these are you know these species eucalyptus your sesam your kejri your neem and your popular and so mostly agroforestry plants yeah some could have been used for agro uh, for compensatory planting as well now coming back to this slide which is uh, the image of gurgaon this comes at a very huge cost it comes at a huge environmental cost natural resources cost all those buildings that you see are standing on pillars on columns and those columns need grit uh, stones rocks to uh, to build those columns you know all that road needs uh, grit and all that grit comes from aravlis <clears throat> this is what uh, happens to aravli when you create such uh, big cities demanding cities you have to eliminate hills aravli hills like these to get hut these tall rising buildings uh this is a very old report of 60000 hectare <clears throat> aravli is mined in mewat gurgaon fridaba until very recently and uh, it has created i mean it, it has it has broken down the whole ecology of the region there used to be trucks piles of trucks running around there still are you you know pali is a stone crushing zone so you can see trucks coming from rajasthan and then crushing stone and then providing for all the development that's happening in delhi faridabad and gurgaon um another major problem with aravli is urbanization if you take uh, alwar if you take sariska uh, landscape if you take um, faridabad landscape gurgaon land landscape there is huge urbanization and we have come to the edge of the hills wherever we can possibly make a house we are making all this so this story i'm talking about is a story of uh, a 380 acre mine site called aravli biodiversity park and this is a story not so much about ecology but about some sincere citizen of gurgaon who wanted to do something who wanted to make change who wanted to bring you know a uh, change in a city Uh, it's story about that it's story about um atal kapoor latika swanzal preeti and group other people of i am gurgaon who kind of stood with this idea and took it forward <coughs> so this barren land you know you, you know mining was stopped um there was huge hue and cry um around 92 uh, you must have heard of uh, mc mehta case aravli notification when mining was challenged and by 2004 mining uh, in and around delhi was stopped so this land if you look in the right side where uh, the pathway 
Uh, I don't know if I can, yeah. So on the right is Delhi. This patch is Arabli Biodiversity Park. And on the left is the city of Gurgaon. So it was left barren. It was a common land of Nathupur village. Uh, when municipalities are formed, Gurgaon municipality was formed in 2009. And so when municipalities are formed, all the village commons, they go to the municipality. And then municipality decides on the land use. It's usually the town planning department, which kind of earmarks the land, says that this will be residential, this will be commercial, this will be you know, used for various other purposes. Somehow this land was uh, missed the eye of town planners. And 2009, 2000, early 2010, when Atul Kapoor proposed to the municipal corporation that we should make this uh, land into a city park. So that's where the journey starts. <clears throat> so this was a stone crushing site. We have close to eight stone crushers on this land. And it was a mining site. It was not very deep mined area. Uh, the mines were mostly illegal, uh, but you can see the mine, mine site. So this is how you know typical valley mind valley you will see, um, and I'll help you with the vegetation. This is in 2010 when surveys were being done as to what is there in the park. Uh, not necessarily the biological surveys, but uh, in terms of what can be done in the park. So you can see the top layer, and very interesting. We have Pranay in in our in this uh, presentation, so he can tell us about all these slabs here quartzite and different layers of quartzite. <clears throat> so what we found mostly was Prosopis juliflora, a few cesium, few, um, a few of the pioneers such as Arc, Tephrosiads, you know, and Sacrum was uh, quite present in all the, all the areas, most of the areas. There were many other seasonal grasses which would come and then perish, such as tragus, melanosulcus, aristidas, and all of those. But uh, largely the landscape was barren. You can see the grit lying, Badarpur lying everywhere. This is another example. You can see this is another mined area. You can, uh, grazing was done here. And again, you can see new crop of Prosopis juliflora not old, new crop of uh, Prosopis juniflora, some Zizipus namularia, the Jhadbeer. Um, and sometimes you would meet uh, Acacia leucofloia, Ronge, or if you are very lucky, you might find um, Dho, Dho in shrub form. So, Atal, after giving the proposal, Atal, Latika, Swanzil, they uh, went to MCG and they said that let's make this into a city park and MCG, uh, Rajesh Kullar <clears throat> liked the idea. He said, oh, let's, let's do it. And Atal started working on the design. And all the pathways were designed by Atal. The boundary was designed by, uh, boundary wall was designed by Atal. And Swanzil, there was an amphitheater which was designed by them. And um, uh, the work started, all the civil works started. So this is the part being made in 2010. This is a boundary wall work happening. It was a simple Gabian wall. And this is 2010 when the inauguration was to happen. And this is a very uh, interesting phase of the journey because uh, here there is a twist in the tale. Um, inauguration was to happen and the chief minister was when he inaugurated. So they, they had to plant. And of course, any special occasion in a country has to be, has to kind of be inaugurated by planting trees. So avenues were planted. And avenues, the work was given to HFDC, Haryana Forest Development Corporation, who started planting the avenues. <clears throat> and the choice of species that they chose uh, for the avenues were, uh, I don't think, and you know, if I ask you, you will easily guess. There were the gulmohas, there were the jacarandas, there were the bakans, there were kagilias, 
these were the species that they were planting for the avenues. Hmm? So meanwhile, Atal, Swanzil, and even Savita Punde, they had worked on the design of the park. And uh, they had made a very uh, detailed uh, drawings of the park. Uh, the original plans were of uh, various elements, different kinds of zone in the park. And, um, and it was to be executed by uh, MCG. So, the, so here we were. You know, the pathways were being made, amphitheater, amphitheater was under construction, and uh, planting works. A little bit of planting was the, being done by uh, HFDC, Haryana Forest Development Corporation. Now, it is very interesting, Haryana, same officers of Haryana Forest Development Corporation met us, me and Pradeep, in Sundar Nursery uh, while we were doing uh, the wild patch of Sundar Nursery. Uh, they came to us and they wanted suggestion as to what all we should, they should plant. And we told them that these are the species they should, they should plant. You know, uh, if it is kohi, if it is a rocky habitat, this, these are the species that they should plant. And um, so they went back satis satisfied. And the gentleman who was leading the planting work was uh, Mr. Subhash Yadav. So uh, they had planted close to 6,000 trees many uh, of a uh, uh, good uh, amount of exotics, but also they tried some natives. They tried Bistendu, they tried uh, Bho, a little bit of Bho, um, Ronj, Komat. Uh, they did try some of the native species. So uh, till now, I am Gurgaon had a very, uh, had, a, had a supportive role while they were giving the design plans to MCG, which was executing the civil works, um, they also gave a plan that let's do, let's come up with an ambitious idea of doing one million trees in a day. And the idea behind this one million tree was that uh, back in 2010, not everybody was doing millions and billion trees, uh, like in recent past people are doing. Uh, so they wanted to make it a big event so that people can be sensitized about million trees, about planting trees. So they went to Pradeep and uh, Pradeep Krishan and uh, you know, took his advice as to what should be done. He suggested them that, you know, I don't know about the numbers, I don't know whether he's you know, kind of questioned them about million trees, but he did tell them that you should plant native trees. And uh, they said, can you help us and he says, I don't have time. He was doing the Raujada Park. Uh, I was sitting there last, so he said, he suggested my name that, uh, that you can contact Vijay. He called me up, he said that they, I met this very interesting group of people, very committed. They want to do native planting in the Aravis. So I was excited. I said, good idea, let's, let's, let's meet them. And when I met them, this was the idea was to plant a million trees and how they were going to achieve this. They were going to achieve this by, <clears throat> by collaborating with the government agencies, forest department, HFDC, Buda, that time the development agency was Buda, MCG. They were going to pool in all the resources and all the lands that were available and schools and plant a million trees. Somehow this didn't work out. Somehow government organizations had their own uh, you know, tick marks to do. Uh, plus to pull one million was not that easy. Um, <clears throat> so instead what they did was they started planting at the biodiversity park. They said, let's, let's pull in resources, let's get plant uh, and plant them at the biodiversity park. So parallelly, uh, HFDC was planting and uh, I am going to also start planting. So I had just come in and I was asking them, about what plants they are going to bring in. And they had a nice list of uh, native plants they wanted to bring in. And they said that we have, we want to bring these species <coughs> from Punjab. Now in our exploration to native species of uh, Aravlis, we had never gone to Punjab. Uh, I'm not sure about Pradeep, but uh, definitely in a Sundar Nursery project, we never went to Punjab to get species. But somehow there was so much confidence in the team that 
you know, these right species are going to come from Punjab. There were close to 20 odd species that, that had come, including Dhaw, Chamrod. So um, when the planting season came and the plants came, um, well, the plants were not the native species they were mentioned, like the Dhaw was not Dhaw. And uh, there was a lot of the, the marauded follies and seashams and uh, uh, baboon. So we had to kind of uh, keep it small, go through the motion of planting and take it on, uh, kind of have a chat. And we, we came back and we discussed as to what, what are we doing and what we should be doing. So after a lot of deliberation, after a lot of discussions, uh, you know, going through the designs and uh, looking at what is feasible, what is not feasible, uh, who is going to take over the land, are they capable of handling a sophisticated park, and what is the right vision for a land which was mined in a city which, is, which kind of represents new world order, which, which represents corporate India or corporate world. Uh, what is the vision that a civil society can bring in? And we thought, we came to this conclusion, and this was after many, many uh, weeks of deliberation, visits to various forest pockets, and kind of convincing the team that we need to think differently. We need to kind of make a statement that we should bring in forest of Aravli. This very Gurgaon, which has been responsible for decimating the forest in its region, should, should kind of uh, give a new narrative that we are bringing back Arabi for us. So the whole um, discussion changed and we kind of went with this proposal to MCG. MCG liked the idea. They didn't quite, quite understand what it meant, but uh, they liked the idea. They said, okay, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Sudhir Rajpal was the commissioner. So my, while he was the commissioner, he also said that why don't we rope in corporates of Gurgaon to do the planting work or to take support for planting work. So I'm Gurgaon, you know, under Lipika's lead, leadership, kind of went to corporates and said that we need to get money for planting. And uh, they kind of worked out a calculation per plant basis <clears throat> and uh, went to the corporate funders. A lot of people came forward, mostly from the families of the people who were working with Gurgaon, all were volunteers with Gurgaon. they kind of uh, were instrumental in first year of planting. Now, um, the, the, the whole business model of Fayam Gurgaon was per tree basis and three years of maintenance. So you had to give, you had to, uh, for a plant, you had to pay 500 rupees and that 500 rupees would take care of three years of sapling care, irrigation and health. <coughs> So which was quite a decent cost, uh, according to me, um, if you were planting uh, uh, Aravli landscape, because our plants are very hardy and they need very little care. But uh, let me tell you that we, in the first year, we had to kind of um, uh, contact, um, you know, Afri, uh, one nursery in Udaipur to, for a little bit of native plants that like, one could source. But the whole idea was to create uh, our own nursery. <coughs> so while I am Gurgaon geared up to take over the planting work with the, with the vision of bringing back the forest of Aravli, uh, somehow MCG kind of took off, uh, took off the you know, uh, oxygen supply from HFDC. HFDC was uh, was funded by MCG and they took off the supply and said that um, from now onwards, uh, everything will happen voluntary basis. So I'm going to go, there was another organization called Uthan who, who was planting some of the plants there. And there was another organization who was planting. So we, we tried to negotiate with these people and, and kind of uh, ask them to, to come and be coherent in the vision that we want to bring back the forest of Aravli. It's not easy. Let me tell you, it's not easy. Planting is, everybody knows what to plant, how to plant, and nobody wants to listen. 
So this was the vision of the park. The vision was create a city forest showcasing the flora of Northern Aravli and uh, uh, which was easy, which was not very tough. Then one second point was recreational space. You see, none of the wilderness, none of the wilderness in our country uh, can be saved if we humans are not interacting with it. Either we are interacting with it for livelihoods or we are interacting with it for recreational purposes. Ramthambur, Corbett, Sariska, all these places are saved because we interact with it. So we, we become a shareholder to it, this place. So this place had to have that kind of a association, uh, you know, relationship with the city and its people. So what was that recreation we had to kind of think through and uh, discuss. So for us, the recreation was education, was health benefits, was, um, you know, bird watching, was uh, uh, looking into the flora plants, uh, looking at the fruits, uh, children coming here and, and uh, learning about uh, wildlife. Uh, that was a recreation for us. <clears throat> of course, uh, the intent of the park was to uh, make people bicycle, um, walk and jog. Um, and the third objective was to work as a groundwater recharge. As I mentioned, Gurgaon is in gray zone of uh, groundwater and extraction is banned. Um, so this, this 400 acres, close to 400 acres, uh, could have been used or is being used as a recharge zone for, for Gurgaon. Now, this is, um, this is, uh, I'm, I'm going to go into a little bit of Arablis. This is from Landar Journal. Here is, this is Arabli, and they are the oldest coal mountains in the country and perhaps in the world. Um, perhaps about 3 billion years old. And uh, therefore, heritage should be heritage. Unfortunately, nobody cares. Uh, this is the district map of Arablis, where you can see which all districts. Um, you can see Aravlis in. So all the way from Delhi to Gujarat, you will find Aravlis. Um, Pranay was saying that um, some of the geologists um, have this theory that Aravlis go all the way under Mount Kailash when the Indian plate met the Eurasian plate. So well, the outcrops are seen up to Delhi uh, in present scenario. This is um, in Sariska, Sariska Tiger Reserve. And um, again, on, um, on the suggestion of Pune, uh, it was, I was fortunate to see this you know, uh, division of land. On the front, I think, and Pune can correct us. On the front is the uh, BGC. This bit, central bit, is the sandstone. And on the top is the quartzite. So this is the cross-section of Aravli that you get to see when you're closer to Pandipol in the Sariska landscape. And it tells you different age of rocks here. And uh, you can, there is so much to learn, so much to know about the geology, as well as the forest. You know? So on the top of the forest, <clears throat> which I'm going to go into the next slides, but uh, the forests have distinct character on all these different rocks and on, on the different valleys. This is uh, Mangarbani, one of the one of the sacred forests in um, uh, Delhi NCR, very, very famous now. Um, uh, fortunately, is protected. Uh, unfortunately, is all sold. Uh, there's a group of uh, individuals in the village, Mangar village, uh, and uh, their eco village, which is trying to save this forest. Um, you can see this whole Anugaisis Pendula forest, and there are patches of Bazalia. This is Gorilya Das Baba's temple, who, who was the main, who is the main deity of this forest. This is uh, on the foreground is Bazvelia Sarata or Salai or Dub Kapir, and on the on behind is all Dho. Dho is, I think, the most important species of Aravalis. It's almost endemic to Aravalis and a little bit in the in the Vindhyas. This is not uh, from Aravlis, but it is from Vindyas. And here you can see 
the Dha forest meeting the seasonal stream. This is in Menal, uh, in Kota. This is again Mangarbani, and you can see the glory of this forest. Different kinds of, we did a forest uh, survey of uh, the, uh, the species. We got close to 250 species in two days of walking in the jungle. And some, some of the remarkable species such as Boswellias, Sterculias, to Hymnodictyon, to Moringas. Um, we didn't meet Lania, but uh, we saw many other important species, Plecotias and Mitragynas and Butias in this forest. Now this is, uh, this is uh, from uh, Jhalana. Jhalana is in Jaipur, very close to uh, the city, almost inside the city. It's, uh, it's known for its leopard population. It's a leopard safari uh, jungle. And you can, you can see, I'm, I'm trying to, I've tried to put down the names of the species there. You can see Salai, which is the Boswellia serrata. And you can see that Salai, always, always prefers the top and the brow of the hill. And then you have this dense green, Ficus mollis, um, very beautiful green um, uh, Ficus, loves rocks. And then you have Dho. <clears throat> you also have Kheerkeep. Uh, I hope I have another slide which shows you Kheerkeep. Uh, this is a valley forest. And this is before Sariska. And uh, you can see uh, again, uh, this is the, the tree in flower is dark, Butia monosperma. You can also find Khajur here. Again, I've tried to put down the names. So on the hill, mostly it's Dhok. Dhok or Dho or Kardhai. And on the top, you'll find Salai forest. We'll go into the Salai forest also, but uh, this is the general um, feature of the valley forest that you find. In the valleys, you'll find dhak, you'll find bays of different kinds, you'll find khajur, chamrod, chilbil, kem, uh, sometimes lania. Uh, yeah. Now, as you go further into the Arabis, you'll find that there is a lot of piling up of sand. And these are uh, old, uh, this is mostly, you'll find this old sand which has piled up and they are mostly stabilized. Uh, this is not this is not from uh, here. It is not from northern Arabi. It is from Barme, but you also get it in northern Arabi. You also get in Sariska. Lots of piling up of sand, <clears throat> and so the vegetation here changes completely. So the vegetation that you see on the hill is very different. It's the hilly typical Arabi species, from Raitias to um, Boswellias to Moringas to sometimes Salvadoras to Anugaises to Lanyas to on the sand dune you will get a very different uh, palette of plants. Uh, you will get more xeriphytic, more thar like vegetation. You'll get Salvadoras, you'll get you know, Matinus, you'll get uh, uh, many a times you'll get Liptodinias, you'll get, uh, you know, more shrubby. It's a shrub one. Um, this is uh, uh, our friend Golak's interpretation of Aravli Biodiversity Park. Here we have tried to visualize the different kinds of forests that we are going to create in the Aravli patch. And mostly we were to make Dho forest. Uh, we also have Bhud land. So we were to make uh, a Bhud forest dominated by Butias. Uh, we also had grassland patches. Uh, phoenix and um, sacrum grassland patches. We had um, Kumat patch, we had Mitragana patch, we had patches, many patches actually. And uh, <clears throat> so this is, this is when we, 2011, we started with nursery. We started with close to 20 odd species. In second year, we collected about 50 odd species. And then 80, then 110, then 100. 60 and I think now more than 200 species we have already added to the Ravli Biodiversity Park landscape. Uh, so when you when you create a nursery it's a it's a it's a it is it 
it's a very interesting journey because you have to know the specimen, you have to know when to collect the seeds. And there are many, many stories I can, I don't think we have time to go into it as to, you know, I would call up the seed collector as to is the fruit ready? And he would say, yeah, yeah, just come and collect this, the fruit. And the baby would reach there, he would say, oh, ye to kal tufana aya tha, sara jah gaya. You know, so there were many, many mishaps when you missed out on uh, seeds, uh, dry fruits, fruits. And on the right is Abdul with a large sapling of Lania Goramandalika. Uh, what we also did in, in all these travels to the Aravli, we kind of fine-tuned which species goes where and uh, in what densities. Uh, so when all those plants were made, we started planting work. Now, you know, theoretically all this is fine, but how do you integrate city? With an, with an enterprise of this nature, you know, because the main stakeholders are going to be the citizen of Bilkan. It's not a private garden. It is a public place and everybody has a say. Like when we were planting, there were people who would come around and say that, okay, you know, why don't you plant fruit trees? Why don't you plant, you know, people? Why don't you plant this? Why? You know, there are so many myths and stories around trees and um, everybody's an advisor. People can... Anybody, you pick up anybody who has never planted or been to a jungle can advise you on what to plant and how to plant. And we have gone through that. We have uh, experienced all of that. Uh, very politely, we used to deny people. Sometimes we had to play cunning tricks. Sometimes we had to like um, some government official wanted to plant 200 people trees. And, you know, there was no way we could stop him because he was a very top official. And, uh, you know, how do you, how do you turn down? And, and <laughs> I'm Gurgaon didn't even have MOU, for God's sake, you know, we didn't have MOU with the government. And when we, you know, after this first year of working freely, we kind of pushed, pushed, pushed MCG and they gave us one letter saying that you can continue working on this place for about eight years. You can, uh, you have to, your responsibilities are to grow maybe forest, you know, have nursery and do research, like we were sorted. But, um, but, you know, to, to challenge government officials like that was not easy. And uh, we, kind of, we kind of steered him to a place where he could plant all his species because there was some Jyotishi who had told him that he has to plant 200 people trees, so he had to plant. And I won't tell you what we did after that, but uh, yeah, but there were many such stories. Uh, one, of the, one of the important thing I would like to go back, which is that we... You know, there was already, there was a relationship with this land of the Nathupur village. And Nathupur, this was a village common. So a lot of Nathupur villagers used to send their cattle in the, in the, before mining, you know. And when mining started, of course, nobody was sending the cattle. Everybody was involved in selling land. And most of the Nathupur uh, village people became rich. And uh, they, they, uh, they started building up. They building up houses for for uh, labor to live, you know, you'll have many, many of these buildings where uh, one room and buildings in Nathapur where people stay, and most of them are li migrant labor. <coughs> and owners of these are Nathapur villagers. But what happened as Nathapur withdraw, withdrew from this uh, land, because there was not enough cattle to graze, and uh, they had people to tend to the cattle, you know, somebody would keep one cow, and uh, you know, rest of uh, and they will have uh, labor to collect grass for them. And uh, you know, there was no need to graze the cattle. But this opportunity was taken over by other villages such as Ayanagar, Ghitorni, uh, who were eyeing this land, and they started sending in their cattle. So we negotiated with Nathapur and Ayanagar and Ghitorni, and Nathapur people came forward and they said, okay, we will take the ownership of this land and. Uh, we divided the land into uh, two halves. One half was what we protected fiercely. Another half was left open for grazing. <coughs> so that was our arrangement with the, with the grazing uh, challenges. Now, I am Gurgaon kind of, this is where I, I really salute I am Gurgaon, the team, how, you know, the whole thinking of getting city into, into doing, restoring the place. Uh, we had close to 50 school children over the last eight years coming and planting in this place. 
all kinds of schools, from Shrirams to Pathways to Hope to Government School, which is adjacent to the park. All kinds of uh, you know class and uh, children were coming and planting in the park, and uh, this was an opportunity to sensitize this generation. It was to sensitize what are Aravis, what are Aravi forests, what are these species, why they are unique, <clears throat> all of that. Then close to 70 corporates came over the last eight, nine years. 70 corporates came and planted in the park. You know, so they would, uh, typically they would have a day of volunteering where, where all these people will come, all charged up that they are coming to plant. So we would say, hold on, look at a demo, see this is how you have to plant. And then we would, uh, we would have the pits and place plants and they would go and their job was only to plant where the pits were there and the plants were placed there. You know, and it was all supervised, monitored very closely. So those two aspects were very, very important in our journey of uh, restoring this place. But, uh, you know, as I said, most of the planting was tree-based. So we had to, you know, we had to do a lot to get the grass cover, to get the shrubs, climbers, herbs into the park. And uh, we tried various methods. We tried seed balls, you know, or Fukuoka style. In different um, uh, in different combinations, I've been you know we have been trying seed balls for many many uh, years, and um, I must I must now kind of rest my you know seed ball experiments that it is good for only certain climatic conditions. <clears throat> so as the as the land was protected, it kind of got recharged. You could see uh, grasses coming up, lots of grasses coming up. And here, um, you know, this is the uh, Boswellia forest on the, on the amphitheater that is coming up. Uh, here, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you some of the uh, areas where um, the transformation, you can see the transformation. This is before our intervention. You can see all Prosopis juniflora. Uh, this is a mined pit and uh, this is after the prosopis was removed in initial years and we hadn't done much of planting and water gets accumulated here. Uh, you can see a revival happening. And this is after many years of uh, restoration work. We have Dhaw forest on the top. We have Boswellia forest on the edge with companion species such as Ficus mollis, uh, Sturkelias, Moringas. <clears throat> we have valley forest of Baboon and on the higher reaches we have forest of Mithrigaina. Another example, this is a water body, seasonal water body. Uh, this is being dug in 2010 and you can see the whole landscape full of Prosopis juliflora and uh, yeah, I'm marking the Prosopis juliflora and this is what it turns into after four years of the restoration work. You can see the amount of grasses that come up and uh, various uh, and good diversity. Then we have, uh, this is very recently, uh, last year. This is what that pond has become. You have tamarics, you, on the hillside you have stercilia, you have boswellia, on the far end you have uh, Hook forest, the Anogasis pendula forest. This is another example. This is from opposite uh, amphitheater. Uh, in, I mean, this is definitely a different climatic, uh, it's in a different season, but in terms of uh, tree species and shrub species, you can only see Prosopis judicata and me. And this is the transformation. Now on the top, we have Australia forest, and the valley, we have Ronge, Dhaak. Uh, much and some bit of coho. This is another mining pit, and you can again see sacrum, a little bit of sacrum happening, and largely Prosopis juliflora. And this is uh, two years back, so that means six years of restoration work. This is something called Peter chalk, and you can see what we were growing our plants on. This is all the uh, 
Badarpur and Kodzite Rock, exposed Kodzite Rock. This is what uh, has happened into, this is 2018. Uh, so result of all this restoration was, uh, we had a good biodiversity coming back to the land. Uh, maybe we are also noticing it more now. Um, uh, it, it became a hotspot for birds. Um, eBird data shows that we have close to 195 species of bird uh, recorded in this place. Now this 195 may not seem so large, but for a, for a habitat which, is <clears throat> which has no water body, this is substantial. We also have Nilgai, we have jackals, we have jungle cats, hare, monitor lizards, um, uh, civet cats, and uh, many other reptiles. Um, this is the survey done by Misha, a study done by her. She was trying to compare the birds, uh, so densities and uh, diversity versus uh, uh, park versus Prosopis uh, juliflora patch. And this is what she came up with, um, quite encouraging. Uh, we, we were able to add more than 200 species to the park, some which are rare, vulnerable, or endangered in Haryana, uh, some which are, which are losing to urbanization. <coughs> so these are some other species. Uh, this has become an educational space. Uh, these are uni university students trying to look at the flora. And we, and we have created uh, 12 one hectare plots. We are, uh, we are on our way to publish our baseline study. And we have uh, future courses that we want to open it up for researchers to take our base data and, and, and uh, you know, understand ecology of a restoration site. And so that, that we see as a very, very huge contribution to, to, to our region, uh, especially the Aravli region, because we don't have many permanent plots on Aravlis, and we definitely don't have enough uh, restoration sites with the native species. Uh, this is very early, uh, you know, 2014, I think, the boarding group came, and I'm very thankful to the Indian bird group, which came in large numbers and which comes in large numbers every year, you know, uh, all the weekends people are there looking at birds from, uh, you know, rarities. Some of the, we get to know that some of these birds are very rare. And some are recorded after 20 years or so. We try to engage citizen in, in, in various ways with the park. And this is, uh, again, corporate people coming and helping us in the nursery. Um, this is uh, our small Thor forest. We have, we would have close to about uh, 20 odd thousand Thor. And roughly about 70% uh, of our land is in Thor forest. And our Thor is of that height now. We can see the Thor growing and that's a group of uh, nature lovers who are crossing the Thor patch. This is uh, the amphitheater. Amphitheater has been um, has been a delight for Gurgaon Wallas to uh, see here Gurgaon itself. Many performances happen here. It's a beautiful spot, um, and you can see the Boswellia forest and the Dhaw forest coming up <coughs> nicely. Now um, you know planting trees is not enough because what you plant how you plant has to be detailed, thought through. Of course, it's not rocket science, it's common knowledge, but it's also important that you see that succession is happening. And this picture gives us hope because here you can see Bazelia seedling happening, you know, in coming out of rock, uh, Badarpur. And we saw many of Bazelia happening. We also saw uh, many other species, uh, some of the pioneers such as Eritias, uh, we saw moringas, we saw uh, maitanus. Uh, a lot came out from the rootstock, but a lot are also regenerating from the fruits um, of the existing plants. So this is uh, on top of the amphitheater, uh, Boswellia forest, and you could notice these young seedlings on that uh, slope. 
So here I'm almost at the end of my um, talk. Uh, I'm so sorry it's taking us too long. We have tried to start with the interpretation. We have uh, done a little bit of interpretation. Unfortunately, we don't have that much time at the park and uh, I'll tell you more about it. Uh, this is how the jungle looks now. <coughs> and uh, uh, some of the jungle patches we also have. This is the Sakram Phoenix. Um, now, what happens to a city forest? City forests have to have a legal sanctity. They have to, you know, a land has to have some protection. Unfortunately, this land, the NHAI with the GNDA came up with a plan to make a expressway through the land. With this design, they would have ruined the whole park. You know, 10 years of work, um, over 125,000 saplings planted, 70 corporate support, 50 schools support, and thousands of people coming and planting in this small patch would have gone to waste. You know, this is, this is what their plan was. And to our delight, to our utter delight, you know, I can't express this, express this enough, that we, we just send a message that this is a plan, NHEI with GNDA is making a road through the park, and next day we saw, uh, not next day, within a week we, have a, we had a meeting and we, we got 1,400 people early in the morning in November protesting against the road. <coughs> This is, this, is, this is what I call, you know, sense of belonging. These people, this park belong to them, you know, and that's, that's where the future of this park belongs. So we took this opportunity to educate children again and the citizen on what this park was, uh, what was its value. And, um, you know, we are still struggling with this um, city forest, uh, integrating it with the, with the city. And, and, you know, with the citizen, it has got integrated. We have to still integrate it with the policies, with the decision makers, with the bureaucracy. Uh, Chief Minister, Environment Minister, all the big secretaries have come to this park, have appreciated this park. In fact, IUCN has done a big study on this park and uh, they were brought in to kind of um, critique the development of the park. And their report is what we show to people now because it, it kind of verifies our work and it kind of uh, gives a it's a certificate of our restoration work. But somehow, you know, forests in Haryana and forests all over in the country are not given importance. They are the least of the priorities. And uh, with this COVID times, I hope we realize something. I hope our governing system, our leadership understands that we need to conserve, we need to save wildlife. <coughs> Yeah, so a lot is possible. I'm not giving up hope, but um, I'm so sorry I have taken a lot of time. So people, um, I, will, I will end my invite for uh, questions from, from the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vijay, for that extremely riveting story about this urban forest. I don't know if you were able to follow some of the chats, but uh, people were commending you on the way that the restoration has uh, uh, worked so well and how the restored sites look now. Uh, the before after photos have been inspiring many people. And we have some very interesting questions. So can we quickly go through some of them? Sure, sure, sure. Nice. Okay, so I'll go backwards. Um, so GD asked if there's a nursery at the park, if outsiders want to access native trees and plant them, is there a nursery? From yes, where they can get there, there is a nursery. And from last year onwards, we have started selling some of the species. Oh, lovely, lovely. Uh, Vinaya Acharya is asking if any invasive were encountered during the restoration uh, process. Sorry? Any invasive species took over during the restoration process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there were many invasives. Uh, one of the prominent one was Prosopis juliflora, and I showed you in many many slides. Prosopis juliflora, uh, especially in that pond area where we uprooted the prosopis, uh, planted with native juliflora, definitely one. Second, <clears throat> we had Acacia totalis, which uh, which we removed slowly. Uh, then there are many, um, um, uh, not so neat, uh, there's Lantana, Lantana camera that we have 
uh, got rid of, but we have to manage because you know it's not an island. Mm -hmm. We have uh, we have lamprana all over. We have prosopis all over. We have meme guys bringing prosopis uh, uh, in their dung. So all those challenges we meet. Uh, then we have parthenium in some places. In the Bhood land, we do get parthenium, xanthium. So all those we remove. Yes, we manage the. Okay. Manage the invasives. So they are removed on a regular basis, is it? That's like, right. That's right. Oh. that's the job we have now. All right. Okay. And uh, okay. So two people ask this: How can one yeah. be part of this restoration, this specific restoration pro uh, project? While Taxo yeah. asked this, and yeah. another person whose name was not clear asked: How can younger people who are who don't have much background in something like restoration work? How can they engage with? Uh, restoration pro projects in a constructive way. So, I am um, Gurgaon has many projects now in Gurgaon. They, they have three projects, and all of them are restoration projects. So, wherever wherever there is a there is a civic project, um, uh, there are three projects. One I know is of forest department, and there is of uh, municipality. Third is of GNDA, and they invite I am Gurgaon to do this uh, planting work. So uh, you can write to Am Gurgaon. We have a Facebook page. You can write to us and say that I want to contribute, be a volunteer, and learn. Because restoration is a field where uh, most of the times it will be hands-on that you will learn. You know? So um, uh, and in the Ravli Biodiversity Park, we have a lot of volunteering opportunities. We we do conduct some of the workshops. We recently conducted a seed broadcast workshop. We will have. <clears throat> we are hoping to do a rewilding workshop this this July, but I'm, I'm not so sure now. Uh, so we do mapping exercise. Uh, mm -hmm. We try to uh, map the flora of the park. So there are enough opportunities. You have to write to us at I am Gurgaon or at Aravli Biodiversity Park Facebook page or to write to me, Latika, or Swanzel, Preeti, anybody. Uh, we are there, yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I guess uh, we can share your, e okay. Uh, we can share the links to your Facebook page. Um, um, once sure. this talk is done, yeah, great. Sure. Uh, Mittal was asking, aren't there any euphorbias here? Yeah, there are euphorbias. There, uh, there are uh, euphorbia caducifolia, especially we have planted. <coughs> it's a uh, uh, there is, yeah. Okay, lovely. Uh, mm. Badri sir has quite a few questions. Uh, he mm. asks, what tricks can one use to convince people to plant native trees? instead of you know exotic trees especially while doing restoration projects yeah so uh, see one of the it it depends if your project site is is open to public like this park was open to public all throughout you know so while we were planting there were people walking around and giving suggestions if you don't have this problem then you don't have to convince people yeah you can go on and plant the native species but if you want to advocate to people that they should plant native species I think you have to take a different route. And the route is of not planting, but of creating habitats. I have in last few years kind of resolved that I will only talk about habitat creation and not talk about planting. You know, planting is a process. Planting is not the end, end objective. End objective is habitat creation. So I think if you use the term, if you, you know, use the right terminology, it is not about this planting, you know, five trillion trees or so, you know, this whole uh, um, planting on the riverbeds and all of that. Uh, if, you, if you talk about habitat conservation, habitat uh, restoration and habitat re uh, recreation, I think then you can much easily convince people on native plants. What is a habitat? What kind of habitat? What are the tree species? What are the shrub species? What are the grass species you find there? And then it will be much easier to to do that. That that's how I would I would see it. Right, right. So uh, related to the habitat restoration, uh, pro, uh, I mean aspect, Gayatri mm -hmm. and Elias are both asking similar questions. Gayatri is asking whether you had to irrigate uh, initially, and Elias is asking because this is such an arid uh, looking place. Yes. Uh, yes. How did you manage moisture in the initial stages? Yeah, so we had to irrigate. We had to irrigate. I mean, uh, let me tell you that in the first year when we planted, we planted six inch tall Anogaisis pendula, this size. Yeah, maybe this size. 
Anogaisa Spindula. And, mm. uh, you know, th and everything was Ram Bharose, <laughs> you know, because our, our operations were, uh, we were starting out and uh, we could not irrigate on time. What we saw after planting, uh, you know, after one month of planting, those plants without irrigation were surviving. So we, that kind of gave us assurance that, you know, if you plant right species, you have to worry very little about irrigation. So uh, in, our, in my ref calculation last year, we, uh, you know, we only uh, irrigate up to three years. And this is also because of our insecurity, because we come from this whole idea of irrigation. No? We think that plants survive on irrigation. Yeah. And it, uh, so it's part of our insecurity. I think in, in the Kitchen Bars project, we have seen that just one year of good, intelligent irrigation and plants can survive. We have seen in other projects as well. So uh, you, have to, you have to understand your plants and you have to irrigate right. So in, in the initial year, we, we were planting, we were irrigating about once a month. And then uh, in the summers, we would irrigate up to, up to three times in the whole of summer. Then the monsoon would come. And then that would carry up to October, September, October. And then you would irrigate one or twi twice in the winter months come. Then you would not have to irrigate. And then maybe around Jan once you would have to irrigate. And if you get rain, then of course you don't have to irrigate. And then again, so, so the irrigation is very, you have to be hands-on. You know, there, has, there can't be any rule because different years have different uh, moisture regimes and moisture, you know, kind of precipitation happening. Like this year, so much moisture we have got. So we don't have to irrigate. I mean, we, I don't uh, remember irrigating a lot. So that's how, and most of our irrigation came from, <clears throat> from STP. We, now we have an in-house STP uh, plant. Phase two, DLF phase three has an outlet to our place and we, we get our tankers filled and irrigate to only places which we need to irrigate. And uh, otherwise we had a tie up with uh, Pullman Hotel, which used to give us uh, mm -hmm. STP water. <clears throat> yeah, so that's about irrigation. Right. Uh, Bhupati Srinivasan is asking this, uh, saying that this project deserves a small book like One Straw Revolution. Are there any such plans? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, maybe you can write. <laughs> I wish somebody could write. Yeah. Nice. Vijay, do you also know uh, of like other restoration sites uh, and what plants can be used in other restoration sites like granite quarries, which are different from the Aravalis? So, so it depends where in uh, granite. Say, if you if you are looking in Aravlis and if you have <clears throat> granite blocks, and unfortunately, granite cutting is very different from quartzite cutting. And uh, you know, they leave very little for uh, scope for. Uh, I I have no experience, frankly speaking, uh, of granite uh, mine restoration. Uh, the, it firstly, it's a very clean cut, and it's very difficult cut. Mm -hmm. I would assume that one will have to refill with the with the uh, with all the debris and then uh, think about the restoration. So there has to be a lot of physical work, physical um, augmentation, uh, because granite by nature is not so porous. No? Right. And the cracks are, uh, you know, the, they cut it very, very. Uh, they try to extract as much granite as poss possible, and they make it clean. So they're often in blocks. So it's very, very difficult uh, setup. I don't know, you know, in total honesty, I don't know how to do it. Uh, any, if I ever get an opportunity, I will, I will experiment like anybody would. That's great. Uh, okay, last question. Uh, actually, this was, you used a lot of common names and the local common names. And since we have people joining in from everywhere, uh, people might not be familiar with uh, what you were talking about. So if you can just quickly recount uh, some of the plants you spoke about and their scientific names so that mm. uh, our audience here is better able to relate, relate to what species you were talking about. Fine. So um, in the Aravlis, what we see on the top uh, canopy uh, climate species is Boswellia serrata and its companion species. So I have referred to Mangarbani forests. So you will find Boswellia on the brow of the hill and you will find 
anogysis pendula on the slopes. Thick anogysis pendula. Now we don't get anogysis pendula uh, beyond uh, beyond our avlis. Um, so, uh, <coughs> um, so that species is uh, tricky. But you get others, uh, other companion species such as Rhytia tinctoria, Rhytia arborea, mm -hmm. Butea monosperma, uh, Methrigyna parvifolia, to Lania coromandelica, to um, uh, Gymnosporias, to Flacortias, to um, um, uh, Tecomela undulata, to Salvadora oleodes, Salvadora persicas. Um, you know, uh, then ficus, many, many ficus species from ficus mollis to ficus palmata to ficus racimosa. You know, many, many species of ficus that you find in the Aravis. So, I mean, there, there are 250 at least species of, uh, I mean, I'm not counting, I'm not counting many um, other, you know, ferns and um, diophytes, but um, <coughs> easily 250. But if you go to Sariska, you'll get much higher density, a higher uh, uh, count, species count. So uh, these are the main species that we planted. In the valleys, we have uh, many, some of the Zizipus species, Mithrigynas, Acacia niloticas, Acacia leucofloras. Um, um, uh, we also have Acacia modesta. So uh, I think, um, Largely, this is this is this would cover cordias, uh, eritias. Yeah. So, is that there uh, is it documented uh, somewhere? Yes, 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 yes. All this is documented. All right. Um, all this is documented. In fact, we are going to publish uh, the baseline, and in that, uh, we will circulate it uh, to everybody. Those who are concerned, we are also coming up with a ten-year report and which uh -huh. will have a, a species list of all birds and amphibians. I haven't talked about amphibians because uh, Suresh did uh, beautiful surveys, last two surveys, and he found eight species of frogs uh, in the park. Right. And he says that uh, this, is, this shows that it is a rich habitat and uh, the water, uh, water in the park is not polluted. And... Um, he has not, in all his surveys in NCR, he has not found one place where he has found all the eight species which he has found in the park. That's Similarly, funny. there is a bird, butterfly count which has about 48 to 48 species of butterflies. Um, and this is again just a one day survey, it's not a detailed survey. We haven't done any faunal surveys such as, you know, of uh, mammals and uh, reptiles yet, but I have encountered some of these species but uh, we would want to do it in our second phase after this we have to do interpretation and we have to do all these surveys we also want to do uh, better interpretation of what what are arablis what are arabli forests and uh, and the flora of the park so is this documentation available uh, on your website uh, documentation of uh, the flora and fauna is it available on your website I think uh, I am Gurgaon uh, has a, a checklist yes. of the plants. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, fauna, fauna, we don't have. Uh, birds you will get from eBirds and uh, uh, butterflies. Abhishek has done a study, um, which is published, which is uh, not published, published, but it's uh, it's reported. So we have a report, small report. Um, okay. So we. Uh, I mean, I'll Gita circulate it to you when it is ready and you can sure. share it with whoever is interested. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so just to inform everyone, this uh, video will be up as a YouTube talk as well. And we link all these resources under the video. So uh, please do keep a lookout for when this comes out. All right. Okay. Uh, I think we are out of time. We have uh, overshot our time. So uh, we'll have to close this call. But thank you so much, Vijay. Thank you for this wonderful talk. And uh, um, people are still asking questions, actually. <laughs> so we can maybe <laughs> forward them to you and yeah, figure out a way of addressing these questions. Uh, please, 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 please. Thank you very much, Geeta and Season Watch. And all those participants who came and attended this, you know, it encourages us you know, as civil society, it encourages us to do something good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks Bye. a lot. Bye, everyone. Bye.